Yeah, hello everybody. I welcome you to our webinar today. The topic is um, Wavelength Dispersive XRF Fluorescence Method Development. And it's the first webinar of a series of three, which will um, uh, explain more under this topic. My name is Rainer Schramm, and I will guide you today through this um, method development topic. In October last year, we made a webinar which was already explaining all this method development. And um, one of your feedback was that we should do that a bit more deeper so that we explain um, everything uh, more in, um, in detail. And this is what we try to do now in a new series of three um, webinars so that we split the content and so that we can go a bit uh, more intense and explain better um, how this uh, wavelength dispersic XRF fluorescence is, um, is working. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to write them either in the chat or in the um, answers and, and questions section. So um, the tools are activated, please use them. And if, if it fits, I will directly answer during the webinar or then if not in the end. Now yeah, we will see them. So I made here you the list about everything what is important to develop a method on, on wavelength dispersive XRF. And the first topic is creating of measurement conditions for measurement of element. That means you have, of course, to decide which elements you want to measure. And then you have to define for every line and every element the measurement conditions. Once this is done, you can start the recording of the scans to adjust the line positions and, if necessary, also to measure backgrounds to get the net intensities. For the detector, you have to define uh, for the pulse height distribution the energy limits on the low and on the higher side. For the calibrations, you have to define what components you want to have calculated. Um, you have to define how long you want to measure every element. Then to get a long-term stable uh, method, you should also define the drift correction. Um, then finally, you need calibration samples to set up um, the calibration. If there are any kind of line overlaps, you have to take this into account. And once this is all defined, then you can do the calibration, which means the mathematical process to calculate on the slope and the offset of your calibration curve. And then, of course, last but not least, but this is not part of this series, you have to validate, you have to prove that what you did is really working. So today, we will go deeper into these four points, while then on the, in the next webinar in, in August, uh, the calibration uh, will be mentioned. And then in the third one, everything about drift correction. OK, then let's start. Um, XRF is used to many different applications, or in many different applications. You see here a big list. Um, and um, when we look on the elements in the real world, I would say from fluorine to uranium, this is the typical range people are using wavelengths dispersive XRF. You can also measure starting from beryllium, but then you need really a special instrument, specially equipped. So there, there you have to do high efforts to get these elements really uh, measured. Yeah. But to understand how wavelengths dispersive XRF is working and um, what we have to do, which measurement conditions we have to choose, we have a little bit to talk how it works. And what you see here is an X-ray tube, which is um, operated under high voltage, high tension. And um, this means um, an electron beam is um, hitting to an anode material, and then um, X-rays are created. And these X-rays then leave the tube uh, through a window, 
and are then guided to your sample. So what we see in the end is that there is a continuous spectrum of X-rays coming out of the tube and additionally some characteristic lines. This is from the anode material where the electrons uh, were um, guided to. And um, so this is characteristic radiation which in most of your instruments would be rhodium because it's a rhodium tube. Yeah. And um, so that means this spectrum this is what um, your sample really um, is excited with. So once this comes to your elements, to your atoms in the sample, and um, I just here made a small atomic model, then these X-rays will hit electrons on the inner shells out so that there is a gap um, produced. And this is what you see now. Yeah, X-rays come in, an electron is taken out, and um, an electron from a higher shell is just filling the gap, and then parallel X-ray fluorescence is created. This is one of the processes. And of course, it depends from which shell the gap is filled. We have different radiations like K-lines, L-lines, M-lines. Yeah? So this is what happens in your sample in the atoms of the elements you would like to measure. If we watch the other side, that means the detection side, then the fluorescence radiation which was created inside your sample um, is guided through a collimator, then through a crystal, to a crystal, and then under a certain angle this is reflected to a detector. Important, the angle on both sides is always the same so that um, only one wavelength is really fitting through this arrangement, this detection unit. And in the end, the detector gets then a small wavelength range because the blades we have here in the collimators, they always have a certain distance. So this means there's a certain range what fits through the collimator and this is what the detector sees and then, of course, the detector itself makes us a bit um, unsharp. But in the end, we get something like a peak like this. Yeah, this is then what we see as a fluorescence radiation on the detection side. So here you see now the full arrangement from the front, tube, sample, collimator, crystal, and detector. And um, now we have to talk about the parameters we need to adjust. On the tube side, it's the voltage and the milliamps. On the collimator side, it's the distance of the blade, so how much radiation you want to let through. The next is then, of course, the crystal, which has to correspond to the wavelengths you want to reflect to the detector. Then we have the angle, um, which is used for the reflection, and of course, we have the detector type. In the end, we have to talk about measurement time, so how long you want to keep that arrangement and register your intensity as counts. And um, of course, also the atmosphere would be important. So do you want to measure under vacuum or under helium? This is not part of this, this um, lecture, but um, this will, of course, also influence um, your measurement result. So that means, in the end, we get something like here shown in that, in that line. So you have an element of interest, copper, for example, with the line Ka alpha. Um, you use the crystal lift 220, and this is the collimator um, distance or divergence in that case. You have selected a detector, no beam filter here. Um, this is the high tension of the tube, the milliamps, the current inside the tube and then expressed as two theta, the angle of the crystal arrangement, collimator, and detector. And sometimes you also want to measure some backgrounds. That means you will have different angles for the line to measure, and in the neighborhood, one or two background positions. Um, this is always good to have, it's always good to have an example to give you some data with that webinar. So I just took my, um, my, my um, application package, Raw Professional, 
which is um, a method we use to element uh, to analyze uh, raw materials, mineral samples, cement, steel, um, so the elements in oxidic form prepared as a glass bead, and um, so, so we have then over all the range of the periodic table some elements with different excitation conditions. And we start with the tube, and there already, already I give you four different element ranges, which are here colored in four different colors. And um, what are the typical excitation conditions for the tube, voltage, and milliamps, so that you have a first orientation. And in my application, or professional, I marked now six, uh, not six, these are uh, two, four, six, eight elements, which are yeah, representative for also the neighbors. Yeah? So the data are a bit reduced, I will show you. And um, there's a different way to do it. Sometimes we use constant tube conditions for all elements, but this is then a bit worse than if you do it in this way. And I just uh, give you here some idea what is the difference, for example, if you would use the combination 50-50, then in the middle range, of course, you would have 100% performance compared to this, but on the low end for silica, about 15% less intensity, and for the very heavy elements, also 30% less. Yeah? Of course, you could combine this by a longer measurement, uh, compensate this by a longer measurement time. Um, this is possible um, if and of course, it depends on if you really need the full performance or if this is not so important because anyway, you're measuring at higher concentration levels. So you see already here different ways, different solutions, but um, you get now some ideas what might be the best for you. So the next thing is the collimator we have to talk about. Um, the collimator are these blades here, which define how much of this fluorescence radiation goes through um, and is guided to the detector. So you see in this animation that the blades can have different distances. And here in this um, scan, you see where the blades are very um, narrow. That means the intensity is small. And if we open, you see the intensity is much higher. On the other side also, the resolution is better when the blade distance is small. Yeah, so here you have to decide what is better for my application. Do I need a good resolution? Um, for example, if these concentrations are getting higher and higher, then this valley here is getting smaller and smaller, so there will be a point where you're not able to resolve this anymore. So in this case, the finer collimator would be the better choice. Here I give you the table um, where you see then what collimator I would choose. And um, of course, sorry. Um, and um, this is now the crystal. So the crystal, I will just go back, is you see it here. Um, this is now has to correspond with the um, fluorescence radiation with the wavelengths, but sometimes we have more than one crystal, and you see for this vanadium and barium example, we have chosen this lithium fluoride 2200, but there would be also the lift 220 as a choice, and in the next, in this, um, in this page, I want to show you the difference. That means, um, if you have traces, like shown in the example before, you would use the fine collimator. But if you have minus, the lift 220 would be perhaps a better choice, because you see that the intensity is not reduced much. You see from 3.2 to 2.6 yeah, by changing the crystal. But the resolution in between is here much better. Yeah, here we have about. Um, um, two and a half degrees, and here we have about five degrees difference. Yeah? So this is much better. So it would mean that if resolution becomes important for you, because you have high concentrations, then 
um, the LIF220 is perhaps the better choice. If you really have trace analysis and uh, you want to see um, high res resolved peaks, the LIF20 with the fine collimator might be the better choice. So it is always good that you take from your calibration set um, a, a sample with a low concentration and a sample with a high concentration for the same element, and then you do these scans to see what is the better choice for your application. In the end, when you have chosen your crystal, then you need to find adjust the line positioning. That means what angle you need to be on the top of the peak. Yeah? This is important for the long-term stability of your method. You always want to measure on the top that in case your, your spectrum is, is moving a little bit to the left and the right, you always see stable conditions over long term. And um, that's why um, it's so important that you set the angle to the maximum. And then from time to time, we also need a background position to get better trace analysis. And this is what I have um, listed here. When you measure no background, you will have a cross intensity, and then your calibration line is going down, and for the concentration zero, you see an intensity. This is only the background. If you subtract the background in every measurement, then of course, if you go down and the concentration is zero, the intensity is zero. This means, because you do that in every sample, even in your routine sample, that the precision for these uh, points is much better. Yeah? And you don't see so much noise like here in case background changes over time. Um, then um, for trace analysis, background needs to be measured. This is the better choice. OK, then um, let's talk about which detector we would like to select. And here we have normally the, cho the choice between two, a flow a proportional counter or a scintillation counter. The proportional counter is used for the light elements, like here, a marked as green, starting from beryllium and then going up to zinc. And then um, we start in the brown color with the scintillation counter. But for some manufacturers, they start already on chrome. So here we have a, an overlapping region where on one instrument you use the flow counter and on the other instrument you use the scintillation counter. Yeah? So this you have to see what is recommended. Um, but then for these elements it's for sure the scintillation counter until barium. And then of course because of our typical excitation with 50 or 60 kV, the measurement of K lines stops. So if you want to measure high elements, so the next one is lantern, lanthanum, then we would go to the L lines which are then, of course, in a low energy range. So again, the flow counter has to be used. Yeah? So this goes up. Here comes then again the same region where both can be used. And then here we continue there. And then from here, the scintillation counter is used until here uranium. Yeah? So this is the way how we have to decide, decide which detector should be used. Here I give you the list for our example elements. And now we see here in a video, I will just go back, um, how is the detector working? Yeah? Um, you see here, this is our arrangement. And um, if we zoom into the detector, you see how the fluorescence radiation is going into it. And then while it's there, um, electrons are produced and these electrons will create in a short time an impulse and um, this is what you see here in that diagram. So what happens? We have here a room which is under high voltage, high tension and the incoming X-ray fluorescence is creating electrons which then destroy this high voltage tension for a short moment. And this is why you see here this, this impulse. And the height of this impulse is exactly proportional to the energy of the X-ray photon which came in. And um, so in this way, we know what energy was registered by the detector. 
And in the end, of course, we know what element it belongs to. And we, we have two different type of detectors. In the case of the flow proportional counter, this is uh, filled with a gas, mostly argon, which is flowing through. And um, the gas is then ionized, like I said, by the X-ray photon into argon plus an, plus an electron. In the case of the scintillation counter, we have here a semiconductor. And the X-ray photon is hitting the semiconductor. And again, electrons are produced. And again, we have high, ten, high voltage. So the same effect will happen. So both type of detectors um, will have here this um, impulse, which has a height proportional to the energy. And, um, and this is then one count in the end. So you remember in your spectra, the intensity is always expressed as intensity counts per second. And this means then how often per second this happened. Yeah, this is what this is what we see. And if we go to the next screen here, we see that um, the detector, um, here you see a scale, kilo counts per second. Yeah, that means this line represents how often the detector has seen an X-ray photon with the same energy. So this is growing then over time, so long as long you measure. Yeah? And um, you see if you have an, a sample now with a low concentration element, that you have only a very small peak here. If you have a sample with a high concentration of your element, you see a uh, higher but also a broader peak. And now what we have to do in this pulse height distribution is we have to define the lower and the upper limit. We have to give the detector the guidance to sum up all these um, pulses to the intensity we then will use to do our calibration. Yeah? So this is the job we have to do. And normally you just can adjust these. So there is a question in the chat, FPC, did, is the flow counter used for barium? Um, for barium, will it be used when you use the L lines? If you would measure the K lines, you would use the scintillation counter. Yeah? So it depends on the lines from barium you want to use. So let's continue here. Um, for aluminium, this is an easy job because we have just this kind of, of uh, picture, but there are special cases, and this is in the range from um, titan to chromium in our periodic table. There, and if we use the flow counter, we have this escape peak. What is the escape peak? It means that the argon itself in our flow counter makes fluorescence radiation, and it uses the element um, energy to do that. And this means we lose now a part of our intensity we wanted to register for our element of interest. And um, at a lower energy, then another peak is coming. So this is also vanadium, but reduced with the energy used for argon. And we have to decide now if we include it or if we exclude it when we set the um, lower limit. And I can just give you the hint that um, for titanium and vanadium, you exclude it. And if you go to the next element, chromium and manganese, iron, you include it. Yeah? You, the only thing you have to, to be careful is that you don't put the lower limit here on top of this line, always on the left side or on the right side. That would be correct. OK, last but not least we have to define our measurement time. And this will, of course, define the measurement error in our um, analysis. And I give you that example. We had this vanadium peak, which corresponds to 0.1% in our uh, manganese ore. And we measure 600 counts per second. If we would measure this now for 10 seconds, we have completely six thousand counts. So if I go now to my table here, then 6,000 counts is in between here. So my measurement error is something in between 1 and 3%, let's say 2%. Yeah? 
Yeah? So if you say this is not good enough, then you have to measure longer. And you see how the error is reduced um, when our counts are increasing. So this is how you can influence your um, precision of the measurement just by measuring longer. Yeah? So this is the influence of the measurement time. So and therefore you should always um, look on how many counts per second you see on your line and how long do you measure. You have to multiply the two figures and then you have the total counts and then you have an idea with this table what is your measurement error. And you will agree if we have this case 2% error on a 0.1% absolute concentration is absolutely good here. Yeah? because this means three decades lower, um, everybody will agree that this 10 seconds measurement time is okay. And then normally we measure eight seconds for the background additionally, so that we have the background line and the element line nearly at the same measurement error to get the same precision for both. Okay, so this would have been my complete um, explanation for these four points and in the next webinars you will see then um, how the calibration is done and the drift correction. I also want to advise you then if you want to have a deeper look into this that perhaps you look on our uh, training platform Fluxamina um, to, to see in these two training courses where a complete calibration is explained from the beginning to the end. And there are also um, software depending uh, calibration courses which then really explain step by step how to set up um, an, an, an calibration or method on these instruments. And then of course the next webinar will be August 18 for how to do calibrations. And now I'm ready to listen to your questions. Okay, there is a question in the um, question and answer sections. Why is the escape peak included for vanadium but excluded for chromium? I will go back here. Um, this was here. The problem is that the escape peak is here really on the left end. And if we go down with our lower limit, we take also electronic noise now. Uh, we would add to our peak, and um, this will make our calibration on the, on the low end side, so for the trace analysis, um, more, un, un, more unprecise than um, if we exclude it. So we don't want to add an additional error. This is why once it's overlapping here with our electronic noise, we exclude it while in the, next, in the next here, the electronic noise here can be excluded by setting it here, and the escape peak can be without any additional error added to our chromium uh, car alpha line. So this is just a, this by a chance it's here. Yeah? This is um, between these two elements. I think um, you have just to, to accept it, that this is a good choice to do it. Um, you always have to test it in your application, what is really the effect in the end. Yeah? This uh, nobody can answer uh, generally, but um, it's a good way to do it. Either you exclude it or you include it. Any more? There's another question. Um, I'm interested in generating a general calibration for many, many mineral matrices. So I don't have to make individual calibrations for different types of minerals. Um, this would mean that you have to exclude the material specific influences. And this is, for example, if you would do that as a brass pellet calibration, um, this would be the particle size effects. So this is the drawback of your idea. Um, if you make brass pellets and you have a lot of um, matrix effect, uh, particle size effects, then um, it will not work really. But if you go to few speed, then of course you exclude this. And like I presented you uh, as the example, this raw professional package, then you already have a good idea to get a lot of minerals in the same package 
and you reduce the number of calibrations. So I would say if you want to do that, uh, use few speed and you have the first step of your idea solved. Um, we have here on page for page eight a question. I will go back to my to my um, I think that is this one, page eight, yes. And you say the settings seem to be 2.4 kilowatt. This is correct. If we have a three kilowatt, should we keep the milliamp and kiwi same as in this table if we want to use the full power? You always have to think a little bit about um, if you have a car and you run it always at full power, I think it will not last so long if you if you drive a little bit more careful. Yeah, this is this is the point here. If you have a three kilowatt tube and you operate always on full power, um, this is probably not so good for the lifetime. So if you would reduce it a little bit to 2.5 kilowatt, for example, then I would have the idea it will last a bit longer. But of course, if you need that performance because this was the idea why you bought it, then do it. And of course, you have to exchange then the tube after it is it is uh, broken. Um, so it's a bit. Um, do you need really three kilowatt? This is the answer to your question, and um, this you have to find out yourself. So then we have another. How to know the relative error when we decide the measurement time? Okay, I go to that. Um, So this part of the table is fixed. So that means if you have so many counts, this is your error, okay? Independent what element you measure, it doesn't mean. This is just the process of the detector, the fact that the detector is counting counts. Yeah? And this defines the error. So that means if you want to answer the question, how long do I want to measure, you always have to think about what is the error I need, and then you can calculate how many counts I need, and then you have to look what is the sensitivity in my element, in my um, calibration, depending on the sample preparation, and then you know this. And then you can calculate the measurement time. So that means your application is defining this, the analytical performance is defining this, and then both together will say how long you have to measure to achieve what you need, really. So then we have a last question here. Does Fluxana offer a general oxide package calibration set? Does it come with suitable drift monitor set? Yes. We have a complete package. This is this raw professional I showed you. And um, this is coming with three different drift monitors and this covers then all these elements. And it's also very easy to expand that package, perhaps to elements which are standardly not part of the package. Um, then you just will get, for example, five, six more calibration uh, beads, and you can expand it. OK. Um, there is another question. Do you have any information on the influence of press pellet particle size on error. Okay, the point is that when X-ray come into your press pellet, on every particle, these X-rays are scattered in every direction. And this is the problem. That means when the particle size is getting smaller, then of course these scattering effects will change. And sometimes then in the way that the intensity is getting higher. Yeah, but sometimes also the intensity is getting lower. Depends on the material and what, how are the elements really presented inside such a particle. Yeah, um, a fact is that the particle size effects are always there. If you have coarse particles or fine particles, you can uh, make it a bit better by grinding longer and getting finer particles. But it's there, and only if you change to fusion. This will um, really take them away. Yeah? But the particle size effects are always uh, belonging to the material and are also depending on the size. 
So what else do we have? Um, so what size would approach the fusion pellet? Um, the particle size to make fusion is only depending, do you get really that powder um, dissolved properly in the glass? Yeah, so of course it's better to have a fine powder, it will easier fuse than a coarse powder. But of course a coarse powder you have to fuse longer so that you get it really dissolved. So in the end you need a homogeneous glass and then it's done. Then the particle size effect doesn't play any role. So there is a question how to determine the lower limit of detection. Um, you can easily do it that you um, take a sample with a low concentration, you know, and then you measure this sample 10 times, then you take the standard deviation, and then you just multiply it by 3, and then you have a rough idea about your lower limit of detection. Uh, this is the easiest way to, to get it out. And then we have another question. I want to know how about rare earth element analysis with wavelengths dispersive method press pellet. Um, yeah, this is probably not so quick to answer. It's probably better I write you then an email with some literature references. Um, I think there's even a book out about this. So um, I will do it then offline. So I don't see more questions. So then I thank you all for um, yeah, placing so much questions and that you are interested in that webinar. I'm very happy and I hope I will see you then again in the next webinar. Thank you very much and um, yeah, have a nice time until next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.